Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome back to the morning show here on Stock Market TV. Oh, my show is up in my ear. That's weird. Spencer, Steve, JC, Alfonso with you this morning. Very exciting show today. Another new guest. We are on a roll with new guests right now. We had uh, Kenny Pokari on uh, on Monday. Today, we're having Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg. He's their senior ETF analyst. Uh, very excited. So he, he's probably, he's on my like Mount Rushmore just in terms of favorite Twitter follow, follows just because I like ETF so much and I like his analysis and his his data and his research and his thoughts and opinions. And I've read his book, uh, or one of his books at least. I think he has more than one. Um, and very excited. So Eric Punchinus will be on at nine uh, to talk ETFs, uh, what he's seeing out there. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk the crypto, the Bitcoin ETFs. We'll talk maybe Ethereum ETF, if, when, maybe. Uh, we'll see what trends he's he's watching in terms of flows and all that good stuff. So that'll be very exciting. That'll be at nine. Uh, we'll have Sean McLaughlin on the show at around 940 or so. Sean put on not one, but two new options trades yesterday. We'll talk a little about that and how you can get access to those trades. Uh, in the meantime, my doc is full. I got a lot of individual stocks on my list here, things that I just want to talk about for one reason or another. Uh, so I hope we have time to, to do all that. Uh, but I know you're not here to watch me. You're here to watch Steve. You're here to watch JC. Um, good morning, chat. How are we doing? Joe, Mary, Ravi, Doug, Lou, Rachel, Dr. Horton, uh, Doug Adam. Oh, I said hi to you already. Uh, Dawson, Ravi. You guys are here early. MS, Robert. What's up, everyone? Jason, Jonathan, how we doing? Hope your day is off to a good start. Mine is. Hit the like. Let's go. All right. All right. When did we uh, start doing the morning show? I will tell you exactly. I, I had a feeling one of you was going to ask one of these days. The first show was May 17th. All right. So we're getting there. Anniversary. We're getting there. All right. What, what Jay say? He's like, I can't believe we've been doing this for you. Oh, no, he froze. <laughs> oh, wait. No, he's, no he, he'll be back. Uh, yeah. No, I, I'm preparing for the, for the one year. Don't worry. And the guests are still good. We're not just bringing on our friends. No, new guest today. New guest today, new guest uh, this past Monday, and a new guest tomorrow also. So, What do you think, JC? Keeping it fresh? Yeah, I think we keep it fresh. I think so. I mean, listen, we're, we're incredibly fortunate that our friends are killing it. I mean, there's no other way around it. I was actually having a little conversation with a mutual friend of all of ours talking about some other friends and how well they're doing, you know, and how far we've come from the little boys club in Soho. It wasn't much of a boys club. There were actually a lot of females there. I feel like there were more females back then than there are now. <laughs> Which is terrible. Yeah. You walk into one of these conferences, a bunch of old white guys. It's so boring, you know? You had a nice community in your city days. You're surrounded by some awesome people. Yeah, you know, I didn't have any kids. I was able to, you know, go to happy hour on Tuesday. You know, I, I had nothing else to do, right? You know, I remember going to some happy hours when I was studying for my CMT. And I was like, I got to study tonight. I can't be boozing, yeah. drinking whiskeys at four. But like, I knew it was in my best interest to probably be at that happy hour, right? Oh, six, oh, seven. And I would just drink Diet Cokes and then I would go home and study. That's You're dedication so right there. Yeah, it wow. is. Uh, you still make it to some happy hours in the city. Oh, yeah. I'm there once or twice. Uh, I'm in the city once or twice a month. I mean, I what do I have to do in the city? Mm. Go to dinner, go to on TV. Go to happy hour. That's what, we, that's what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I feel like that doesn't happen as much anymore. It used to happen a lot because everybody was in the city. Because everybody has kids, know. JC. It's the new generation. The new generation is just, you know, they're on their, you know, on their Twitter and the, uh, you know, remember Foursquare? I'm old enough to remember Foursquare. That was the thing. Dude, I remember Foursquare. Remember Foursquare? I was just like, I don't know what that is. I've heard of it. I don't know. I don't know what it is, though. It's you for like check in when you got to the bar. And if you, if, you, if you were at the bar like a certain amount of times, you became like 
the president of the bar or the captain or four square was a place where you could stalk all your friends and say oh they're there oh they're over there yeah but you would check in but if you checked in a lot you became like the senator or something like that i forgot what the name was but like you were like so so they got snapchatted uh Uh, no 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 no. i just think it was it was just too much it was too much too early too early um, I got some. I got some market stuff. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we hit it, Spencer? Oh, okay, sure. Is it play? No. no. All right, ladies and hey, gentlemen, ladies and let's gentlemen. do a quick little uh, market rundown. Dow futures up one hundred and forty points this morning. That's about a third of a percent. S&P futures up about half a percent. That's 23 handles, just under 5,300 for the S&P 500, just below 40,000 for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That's cool. Uh, NASDAQ 100 up 60 basis points, almost two-thirds of a percent. Um, Bond futures, after a nice little reversal yesterday to the upside, uh, flat to down this morning. Uh, Not much happening in metals. Uh, Gold down 50 basis points. Silver flat. Copper actually up a full uh, 1% this morning. Crude oil down a third of a percent, down to about 85 bucks. Dollar mix in early trading, up against the euro, down against the yen. And you've got the volatility index back to 14, and U.S. 10-year yields up at 4.36%. Uh, Spencer Izzio, what do you say we check in on a little funny money, huh? You've got Bitcoin. Yeah, but let's, let's not, do me a favor, and let's, let's not overthink the Geo Biden today, all right? Uh, BTC 66,666, believe it or not, uh, up 1% on the day. Ethereum also up 1% on the day, about 3350. And, um, you, you, you wanted to talk about the geo Biden. Um, no, that's not what I said. The geo, geo Bowden. Sorry. Uh, geo sorry. Bowden is up oh. 33% on the day. Uh, new all time highs uh, for the geo Bowden. My bad. Yeah. Bowden. Right. Yeah, all the meme coins are up. You've got uh, Dog with Hat up 9%. You've got the Mogs up 7%. Bonk up 6%. The Doge up 4%. Uh, Mew is up 4%. The Shiba's up 3%. Pepe up 3%. Flocky up 2.25%. All of them up across the board. Except for Brett. That's Pepe's uh, best friend. Down 10% on the day. The story so far in Q2 is no longer the cryptos though it's commodity markets i mean oh my god you want to hear what the best troll ever was you know peter schiff is going to go down as like the greatest troll ever right you know that guy who's who's been we, telling you to buy gold like for 20 we years can try to get peter I, i've i've talked to peter before uh we can try to get him on write the, the book about the all-time greatest trolls he's got to be a full chapter uh Look, I don't he's I don't pay much much attention, but you're saying he actually trolls people. I thought he used to. Uh, no, not no, no, no. It's 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 ne- it's meta trolling. It's next level uh, trolling. This he's going to go into the Hall of Fame of trolls, right? Mm-hmm. Like this this is the guy that the trolls look up to as like for guidance, you know. Like he's like our Phil Perlman, but like for trolls, you know. Uh, he's really good at scaring people. He's um, great. He's one of the one of the greatest that ever did it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. All right. So look, ready. Check out, look how masterful of a troll this guy is. Ready? Go to slide two. Look at this. Look at Can this. I tell a quick, I have a quick, not that good, but this. okay. This is, this, is, story. this is meta trolling. Like, this is next level trolling. This is the guy who's been telling you to buy gold for the last 15 years. His gold has gone nowhere or down. Look at this. So far in Q2 2024, here are the results. Silver up 8%, gold up 3%, Bitcoin down 7%. The results speak for themselves. I mean, this is this is primo. Shout out, shout out to uh, Peter Schiff. Shout out. That is that is just next level. No, um, you don't think that's good? That's better than anything funny. I could do. No, it's funny. Uh, my my Peter Schiff story is the first time I interviewed him. This is like in 2016. He he got all mad because I guess he didn't realize that it was going to be on camera. And he was like, I don't have, I'm not wearing any makeup. I can't do this. <laughs> and then that was sort of the end of that. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, listen, good, good. Shout out, shout out to Peter. It's a lot, it's hard work being such a good troll. Um, yeah. I, I got, I got a, speaking of trolling, I, um, I, uh, I don't talk about like 10x returns, 20x returns, yet alone 30x returns. 
right? I never, ever, ever, you guys know me. I think I, I, I don't, I can't think that far ahead. Like that's just like that's another stratosphere to me. I kind of laugh when people say stuff like that. But, but every now and then, and by every now and then, I mean like literally never. Um, check out uh, slide three. <clears throat> so we're looking at a 15-year base, guys. 15-year base, right? And while we're looking at a 15-year base in energy, I don't think that energy is going to go up 30 times. But can this sector triple? You think it could triple? Yeah, it did last time. Um, it's up 400x just in the last four years. So what's another triple from here? So based on the position that we put on yesterday, if this thing if this thing triples, which by the way, last I checked, when you look at the holdings of the S and P five hundred, I want to I want to give an accurate reading here. You're looking at the S and P five hundred is giving you three percent energy, three uh, percent. The Nasdaq one hundred is giving you zero percent for the record. How much is the Dow giving you? Less less than three would be my guess. 2.4 would be my guess, let's see. The Dow is giving you officially 2.55. That was pretty close. 2.5% in the Dow, you're getting an energy. 3%, 3.7% in the S&P, 0.0% Mr. Blutarski in the NASDAQ 100. I think the unwind can be incredibly powerful, particularly coming out of a 15-year base. By the way, Extraz, I don't know if you realize this, but the XLE itself is the ETF that tracks this index, has not made a new all-time high. But yesterday, the index itself, the S&P 500 Energy Index, closed at a new all-time high. Two days in a row, actually. It's the same chart. It looks the same, but if you really want to get down to... I remember how like you and I, at least me anyway... I'm like, is this really the breakout? We haven't taken out the 2014 highs. Can we really say that this is the breakout? You know how I've been saying that? Mm -hmm. When you look at the index, we've already taken out the 2014 highs. So is this the breakout? That is interesting. It's different in that way, for sure. Um, this is, the, yeah, this is the breakout. It might take time, but it's happening. Right. It might, be, it might not be the cleanest, which is why the position we put on yesterday gives us plenty of time. We've knocked on the door three times already. At least, right? Depending on how you count it. Yeah. Right. More recently, the, the knocks on the door keep happening faster and faster. You notice that? Textbook, right? So tests of resistance become more and more frequent before a breakout. And that's exactly what we've seen over the past few years. Just keep hitting this level, absorbing more and more overhead supply. When you look at breath, you look beneath the surface. What, just a month ago, we were coming on here saying the midstream stuff looks really good. The refiners, great. But oil services, explorers and producers really got to pick it up. Oh boy, have they the past few weeks, right? So breath is there. The, the internals for this sector more than support a resolution. And then if you look at other groups of, of uh, markets, if you look at materials, I think that's also supportive, right? It's the whole commodity stock theme. Yeah. You go look at futures markets, crude oil. We've been talking about the ags. Now the industrial metals are getting it together. We're getting, you know, a 15 year breakout in gold, silver, talking about silver like every day on here. So everything is coming together and supporting a breakout in indexes like energy and materials too. Uh, Spencer, can we uh, can we throw up that next slide there? <clears throat> I'm getting a lot. I'm getting a little heat there on the uh, you know on the twitters and whatnot. Um, you know, and emails people telling me that the the, the the what what downtrend, JC? The market's at all time highs, JC. Right, maybe. But when you compare it to the behavior of energy stocks, this is a really nasty downtrend. Am I getting cute here, Straza? Or do you think, you know how Straza likes to keep me in check, right? He doesn't let me get away with anything. How about this? You think, I, you think I'm on point here or you think uh, I have mental problems? This started years ago. Right. Right. Usually we're looking at this upside down and it, and it coincides. So the big blow off top, uh, the big blow off top here coincides with the blow off bottom in crude oil. Right. When it traded below zero. That's the mother of all blow off bottoms right there. The I mean, mother of all blow off bottoms, Spencer Israel, coming I mean, in hot this morning. Negative 40, right? Wait, yes. negative 40, right? Is that how long it? 
Not that anybody really bought it down there. Yeah. Yeah. Chart shows. Do you change your data, JC? I change my data. What do you mean? I, I don't I don't let that stick go all the way to negative 40 and ruin my chart. I clear you it. Up. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, this is a ratio. Yeah. Okay. And it's and it's an I, index. So and, and this is these are energy stocks, not crude oil, also. So there's no negative. I'm just saying, if you're doing a crude oil chart, are you fixing that? Or are you showing it fall below below 40 and, and your y-axis goes negative? I do both. I do both. Yeah, because I could just I could just uh, open up the Y axis and then it goes under the screen. It doesn't matter, you know. Oh, that's true. You do that. Yeah. Okay. And also, I'm not really that interested in those lows at this point. I'm more interested in resistance and where we're going. Right. I'm not really like looking. Right. Like those data points at this point don't matter. Yeah, you're right. Well, I don't think they ever will. But yeah. <laughs> I uh, honestly, who the hell knows? I mean, they might. You know, it wouldn't surprise me. I hope. Um, so what? Yeah. How do? We, how are we feeling about this? I'm, what do you think, Straz? Am I? Am, you think that this is legit or is this bullshit? Is this JC oh. just? No, I'm on board with this. Yeah, this is real. I think this is this is the place to be, uh, probably for the remainder of this year, maybe longer. Classic rising wedge, or am I getting cute there? I like it flipped, and it's a scoop and score, right? So that last peak before you have the second red arrow drawn, we just barely incrementally made a new high. And then failed miserably. If you flip that down, it looks like a beautiful little failed breakdown and go. A uh, little little scoop and get some, like JC Pretz likes to call it. Scoop and get some. I yeah. like it. Um, is this Wait. too too easy? Chapter two of technical analysis kindergarten, right? Like chapter two, head and shoulders top, rising wedge. Too, too easy? I think it's a good thought to have. I think that way a lot. And I usually talk myself out of it. No, I don't think it's too easy. A lot of people aren't looking at ratio charts anyway. So you think this is I mean, dead on? This isn't like the most obvious and talked about head and shoulders top in NVIDIA that they're discussing on, on Kramer's show at night. You know what I mean? This one's a little bit, well, there's, there's some obscurity to it because it's a ratio. Yeah. So you think I this have, is 100% dead on? That's it. No no, no problems, huh? I, I don't like it when Straza agrees with me so much. No, this is a big chart. Um, and I have a fun one for you that I want to show you real quick. Yeah, but what's not obscure is all-time highs. For XLE, that's not obscure. Uh, are, I don't think they talking. were all-time highs for XLE. What? No. They never got there, but like JC's saying, the index that XLE tracks may right. have XLE's not. still nowhere near all-time highs yet, FYI. Uh, you got to break through 100 to get to all-time highs on XLE, Spencer. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, well. But are right. we betting it goes there, gentlemen? Yes. <laughs> uh, you got to get to 101 and a half for XLE oh. to make new all-time highs. All right. Still so at 97. Ratio charts are fun. JC, this is the same thing that you just showed uh, flipped upside down. This is the tech versus tech ratio. You know, a lot of people like to do Ooh, fang. Oh, I like that. Yeah. A, little, a little fang on fang or tech tech on tech. Yeah, fang on fang, tech on tech. I like yeah, that, this, Straza. I like that. The, the the tech you want to be overweight in today's market is not the tech that you think it is. So this tech is tech with a K, not tech with an H. That's right. So this is tech resources. Uh, their materials, their energy, they're a little bit of everything. The chart looks great. Sorry about that. You could more or less use it as an industry bellwether, a commodity stock bellwether. So this is commodities against tech. It's new leaders versus old leaders. I want to see us get back to the upper bounds of this range, resolve higher. Uh, then you get some sort of a multi-year range breakout, just like the range breakouts that we're seeing on an absolute basis in materials and energy and the various subsectors. That to me is confirmation of longer term leadership. I'd just like to, I'd like to add here tech with a K Right, I'd much rather be in tech with a K than tech with an H. Fun fact, this stock tech resources is Canadian, eh? Vancouver. It better be. Also, fun yeah. fact, 110-year-old company. Yeah, this is a bellwether. This is a big one. This is a big one. Fun we don't fact, talk about 20, 25 billion, I believe, something like that. You know what? I want to give more love. 25 to billion. More love for tech resources on this, this what, what are we calling it? Wave three? Commodity super cycle. Hey now, who's counting waves? Hey now, did you just say is this a wave three? Who is this guy? I did open up a book and and check your guys' work on the wave stuff. All right, wave wave three it is apparently. Well, yeah. you think I'm making this shit up? Oh, I, listen, I'm not going to come on here and tell you what wave it is, but I, I wanted to check for myself and I did. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not like um, I'm not like Mr. Elliot Wave Counter guy. Uh, I think that's a distraction. I think it's too subjective, you know, but to understand that that, you know, the the meat 
in the sandwich, right? So like that first wave one is like the bread. And then wave two is like, you know, maybe a little mayo, maybe a little mustard underneath that wave three. That's going to be that juicy piece of meat, maybe double stack, triple stack. You know okay. what I'm saying? So this can really get going. Then you get the corrective wave four. There's your lettuce and tomato and cheese and whatnot. And then that sesame bread that all oh, that lovely, you know, maybe maybe a potato roll, maybe on the top there. A little how you doing, right? Maybe like a, like a yeah. toothpick with a pickle or something on the top. Pickles on you know? top. Pickles, Pickles on, on top. top. Yeah. That's wave five. Okay. Where where is your head at on the pretzel buns? They're getting popular. The pretzel buns. You know, I, I need like? to do more research. All right, I need to I'm, do more research. I'm okay. Theoretically, with it. it's overpowering. Theoretically, but I don't want to. I don't want to just jump to conclusions. But in theory, it's too much. All right, all right. But I don't know. Like sometimes, like I remember thinking that using chicken thighs for chicken parm would just make sense because chicken thighs are better than uh, than chicken breasts. Right. Mm -hmm. But that that was a fail. That was that was something that made sense in theory. But in practice, poor execution. You don't need extra grease. You don't. Right. You want the the dryness of the uh, or the more dry, less yeah. fatty, less greasy breast because you're getting the cheese and the sauce. You got enough of that. Right. Olive oil. There's enough of that. You don't need more grease in the thighs. So something in theory that would make sense in practice was a fail. General rule of thumb. Uh, if a food has made it all the way down to the fast food restaurants, the trend is in the late innings. And Wendy's has had pretzel buns for years. So fine, fine. All right. So I'm 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 behind. I guess I'm late. JC, your head was in the right place to try it though. Yeah. Um wait, I have a question about energy. I I, I sent this to Steve the other night and he ignored me. Uh so, but, so I'm getting to it. Oh, you're getting to it? I, I just want to know if I'm overthinking this or getting too cute. I have a chart, it's it's slide. Slide three, I don't know if you want to bring it up. It's not from us. It's from uh, this newsletter that I get, uh, or this free thing, the ETF Research Center. This is looking at the AUM and the market cap of all the sectors, right? Nice. And you see, Spencer, I told you the pie chart was the move. Okay, hold on, though. So here's the point that I'm that I'm trying to make. The point oh. is the, the, the slice of each sector um, are, is, is comparable in both charts, right? The size of XLU is pretty much the same in both charts. The size of financials pretty much the same in both charts the two that stick out to me they're not the same size are tech and energy but what is look at look at the size of the tech slice yeah and market cap yeah compared to the aum one on the left and the size of the energy slice they're very different so am i correct in interpreting this to say that people are people who own these etfs uh are actually overweight energy compared to their overall size and underweight in technology compared to their overall size. This is a great point by Spencer. Great point for Spencer. <laughs> Somebody hit the button. Somebody hit the button. Somebody hit the button. I don't have a button. Nobody's going to hit. JC's not going to hit the button. Look at this. No, because you're not including the assets under management in the NASDAQ. Choo choo, motherfuckers. <laughs> you're not including the, uh, you're not including the, uh, the assets under management of the other indexes, right? You're assuming every investor is in the S and P 500. Yes, yes. The, the, I'm talking just S and P here. Yes, that is correct. Assumptions right. have to be made. Yes. And the assets under management is 39 billion dollars in the XLE. Is that what it is? Yeah. Is that really all it is? I, again, I, this is. I'm sure this is as of the end of the quarter. So, no, yeah. Got it. So, it's, like a little bit, a little bit more than the assets under management in Dogecoin. Listen, energy is underowned. Right. But when I so see this, do, are people overweight Dogecoin? Hold on. When you see this, don't you think maybe energy's not as underowned as no. we might think sometimes? Absolutely not. It's, just, it's the third largest spider. That's real no. money. That's the people's, answer, people's the answer, money. The, the answer is no. Spencer, I think it has a lot to do with the construction of the index, right? Like this isn't this isn't a secret. We come on here and we say it a lot. We've been saying it for four or five years now. You're not getting energy in the S&P 500. People know that by now. And XLE is the best next option to do that. So maybe if you're, say you're super passive, you buy SPY, you buy Qs, and then you have a little sleeve of commodity stocks, like a little XLB, XLE. I'm surprised XLB is actually so low and XLE is so high. Because I, anyway. no, I, 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 I would say I, the same. No, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and kudos to Spencer. Um, great point. But my 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 final answer 
is no, that does that is not evidence at all that energy is over owned. <laughs> You'll get one by him one day, Spencer. I, I'm dude, thirty nine, dude. How much is it? Thirty nine billion dollars. Thirty nine billion dollars, and and nothing is the same thing. Stop. Um, That's me. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. But the other point was that tech well, the XLE is under owned, and, and and the top ten meme coins like add up to the same amount, like. So are the meme coins? The other point though was that tech is underowned. That was the other point that I was making, right? Well, that we know for sure ain't definitely ain't true. Well, oh, no, you know what it is? See, I I can explain away the tech part of that pie chart. They're getting it in everything else. Oh, they, they don't. Oh, need, they don't yeah. Nobody needs that ETF, bro. No, 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 no. Steve's point is that is it, that it, communication services and it, yeah, right. That's all tech. Investors anywhere are getting plenty you, of that already. Yeah. What people need to understand is anywhere you go. All of the most popular funds, you're getting like NASDAQ 100 exposure. Yeah, okay. Like a lot of them. It's no, just but it's a, good thought, it's, a, it's a good thought process, Spencer. I'm not, you know, sometimes I'll abuse you and I'll rip you, right? Because you okay. deserve it. This time, you know, this is a legit question. Hey, I'm like, totally good. Shout out to the ETF research centers where I got that. Uh, oh, go look at the factor ETFs. Go look at value. Go look at growth. Go look at momentum. Go look at dividends at this point. It's all Mag Seven stocks just dominating yeah. the weightings. Most true. Of the a lot of these ETFs, but, but the Mag Seven, as we've discussed, like no, I know the Mag Seven is not just in the technology sector. So right. go, go right. look at the new Actually, AI. Only, only, I think only two stocks Mag in the Mag Seven are in the technology sector, right? Right. So okay, the tech point is heard. I, I retract my statement. Energy, I don't. I do not retract my statement. Nobody owns yeah. it. But good luck. Good, good luck, Spencer. Good start. All good right. Day. Uh, okay, we're going to have uh, Bajunas join us in a second here. Um, what was I about to say before we got on that that uh, that 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 tangent? I had something to say, and I don't know what it was. Oh, well. I forgot what was in my head. Uh, I, I, I love how we're talking about all these ETFs, and um, Eric is, is coming on. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, er Eric is uh, one of my uh, favorites. Um, definitely for sure. He's, uh, he's I, I read his so book. On point. On... I mean, he's been on point for a lot of things for a long time, but you know, all the stuff with the, um, uh, with the Bitcoin stuff, he's on point. Wait, I'm trying to look at the chat. I'm trying to catch up something about total return on the chat that I missed. Uh, I don't, I don't see anything on total return. Yeah. I mean, neither. I don't know what Steve was talking about. Um, Okay, no, in the this would be a good a good uh, question for JC to take. Dividend wow. adjusted XLE is already in a clear breakout. Yeah, so, yeah, Verizon too, or, or AT. <laughs> yeah, there's no price memory there, right? Well, there's so, no price memory there, right? So we're we're, we're specifically like that is 100 percent true, which is great, right? Uh, but that's that's not what we're we're what we're discussing here. What we're discussing is. The resistance, which is defined by an overwhelming amount of supply relative to demand for XLE at that price, right? So the, right. To the total return picture is not that. These are two different conversations. Um, the total return picture looks great, obviously, making all-time highs. That's great. But this, we're, we're specifically referring to the uh, supply and demand dynamics of a given market, which are at this price. Um, and it looks like they're doing their damn near hardest to to break through that. Really curious to see what this weekly candle looks like on Saturday morning. And, and it is important to know if you open up an account and put just XLE in it, your market value graph will look just like XLE on a total return basis. So we're not saying it's not important, but in terms of looking for logical levels of overhead supply or polarity levels, or trying to gauge like where a breakout uh, occurs, you can't use the total return because what they're doing when they adjust for dividends, they're literally going back and they're changing the history of the chart, right? So it didn't look that way when we were transacting 10 years ago, right? I keep changing it. So I need some more coffee. All right. Uh, Eric will be on in a second. Before he, he joins us, why don't I just run through some, some things on my, on my list? Because there's a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of things. And I, I, know we have, I know we have a couple of charts. We don't have charts on all of them. Um, Fonz, can you bring up the chart of this? Uh, do we have the UWMC or the rocket? I don't know if we do. There we go. I think we do. Uh, so this is pretty interesting here. Uh, the story is that uh, there's a basically there's a short report out on UWMC, 
um, two days ago. I think two days. Yeah, I think on Tuesday. And it, 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 it was a short report, but it was written like it was like an investigative journalism piece, which is very interesting and very new. Um, and uh, they were pretty upfront about, you know, this was a Paris trade. You know, the, the firm that, that funded this report is, is long, Rocket, in short, UWMC. You can see the big red candle there on UWMC from the other day. Um, so it, this firm put on this, this hedge fund put on this Paris trade. But Rocket and UWMC, as you can see, trade pretty much one to one. Right? They tra- they're very correlated. They trade together. So this firm's report hit UWMC, and it also hit Rocket, which they went long. I assume via options of some kind. So um, I don't. I, th- I thought it was a great, a great lesson in in knowing relationships, right? Um, and obviously, I don't know the details of the trade that they have. No one does, except for them. But they did say that they're long rocket and short UWMC. And mm-hmm. <laughs> they're both going down now. So, so long uh, rocket. RKT. Short, right. Short UWMC. And then short. So rocket. And then short UWMC. Oh, Josh, I haven't read Matt Levine in a couple of days. I have to. It's this is a very interesting. All right, I didn't realize he was all over this. I, this is a very interesting thing to me. Um, this like hybrid. It's like a hybrid. Uh, it's like a hybrid hedge fund slash news outlet. Very, very strange. Very novel. And they they put on this pairs trade where you're long RKT. And then yeah. short the UWMC. And then can you explain to me what UWMC is? I'm not following. U- United Wholesale Mortgage. It's they they both are mortgage companies. Got it. So it's two different companies obviously. that do the exact same thing. That do the exact same thing. So they're competitors. Isn't yes. it the two? It's the two largest residential mortgage companies. In the yes. World. Yes. Or country. Yes. So and they're long. Is- they're UW- long rocket though, right? Yes, and they're both headquartered in Michigan. Yeah. One of them rockets in in Detroit. UWMC is in, is in, I think, Pontiac. Um, oh, is that why you're so interested? No one does mortgages like Michigan. <laughs> Go throw up, uh, throw up slide. They, they used to say that about cars, and now they're the worst. No, right? no one does mortgages and pizza chains like Michigan. I'll bet they, um, do these I'll mortgage bet companies have to deal with all these unions or no? No. Thank God. Uh, so this is the trade they have on, and it's working. <laughs> uh, Spencer, I missed it. I, I ran downstairs for a second. Sorry, why, but why are they bearish UWMC though? Same basically, the, the the whole thesis is UWMC isn't ag- doesn't actually shop your mortgage around. I'm sorry, independent brokers don't actually shop your mortgage around. They just funnel you over to UWMC. That's and so um, and that's they, bad. Like, yeah. Anyway, uh, wait. I, we, we have Eric now, so can I bring uh Mr. Butchinis on and, and we can talk about this more after? Please. All right. Jay, we've make, been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. It's a nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Hey, Eric, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. No, this is great. You do great work, Eric. I really just want to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you've been all over the whole Bitcoin thing and the assets coming in. It's really been fascinating to watch. You know, I, I know a thing or two about ETFs, I suppose, but I, I don't know the, the ins and outs uh, like you do. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Straza, if I start stealing all the con- all the questions, you could jump in. Straza, Eric, Straza doesn't like it when it, we get really good guests on and I just take all the questions, you know? <laughs> he's, a, he's, not a, he's just not a good group interviewer. Today will be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, start Eric, with, let's start I, with the elephant. I want to hear about the elephant. Okay, I what... Saw- Hold on. I saw Eric at, uh, what was it? The Miami ETF conference. Exchange. I to, yeah. Yes. Say hi and introduce myself. But you're surrounded by people everywhere you go. There's like a line of people. <laughs> at an ETF you, event. Yeah. Why do in you reality, it's, it's not like that. But yeah. I mean, I've been, <laughs> I've been in the industry for 20 years and I'm in the media. And a lot of times it's a, really just the issuers who are looking to market, right? So I have a, a podcast and a TV show and I write. So they're like interested for me to cover their stuff. So um, I try not to get a big head over it because they just, a lot of it's people want attention, but it's a genuine 
um, scene and I've been in the scene for 20 years. So I should know people by now, hopefully. And, and oh, I do. Yeah. And that one is like dense. I'll go to other conferences where I know a, a fourth of the people or even less. Those are the ones sometimes I'll bring my family because I'll have more like downtime. But exchange is like so packed. I can't do anything. I, it's like a 12 hour whirlwind. It, it must it, have been exhausting. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> we, we talk about, you know, secular growth uh, sectors and industry groups on here as analysts all the time. You've been involved in one for the past 20 years, just from the ground floor. The growth, it's been a mega trend for ETFs. When does it end? Now, I think they'll be here for a while. There's a lot of talk about direct indexing, replacing ETFs. Some people talk about tokenization. I just think the ETF just just arrived. Like we just got to this investor utopia where you can get almost anything under the sun with one click of a button anytime you want for almost no fee. Yeah. It's beautiful and it's tax efficient. We just got here a couple of years ago because ETFs really, I think they broke through in 2021 when they took in a trillion dollars. That was when my one man army show ended finally within Bloomberg. And uh -huh. even my company was like, all right, we got to get behind this. I think that's when like Morgan Stanley jumped into right. ETFs and Federated and Capital Group. 2021 was the, the big year that everyone just said surrendered. And I think when you think about tokenization and direct indexing, a lot of this stuff uh, to me, tries to reverse the pendulum a bit. Uh, ETFs are fast, good, cheap. You know, direct indexing is a little more complicated, a little more expensive. Um, tokenization, I just think that e e with ETFs, they trade on a public exchange. There's so many regulations around ETFs too that you have all this stuff plus they're safe. I mean, and plus you got these giant companies who who really don't want any kind of a PR problem. This is part of the reason why I had no doubt that uh, BlackRock and Fidelity jumping into the Bitcoin race would be so big because it's not just that a Bitcoin ETF exists. It's that some of the biggest issuers who are serious uh, are launching them, and they do not mess around. They've got hundreds of lawyers and compliance officers and legal processes, and that's really a really big deal for a lot of the more serious advisors of the world. It uh, gives them cover and, and uh, sleep at night. Versus buying something on Coinbase, uh, which is can be a lot of commissions or having a wallet, that kind of self custody can be uh, give you nerves. Um, so I, I just think that ETFs in general are, um, you know, I've always said they're like a mutual fund with benefits, um, and I equate them to the MP3. You know, to me, they have made all other forms of music, you know, vinyl, tapes, CDs, they just all clunky compared to digital. And so I thought that's the, my best metaphor for it. Um, and it's why I just dedicated my whole career to it. So I don't see them being disrupted for a while. Um, yeah. At some point, you know, we'll evolve into something else. But remember, we just got here a couple of years ago. Mutual funds had a hundred year run. They started in the 1920s and they're just now dying off, right? That's a hundred years. So I think we go at least 30, 40 more with ETFs. One more question before we get into the current markets. I wanted to ask you about, about that transition from mutual funds, right? Uh, can you explain where the 401k situation falls in and, you know, the exposure to mutual funds? Some of them allow ETFs, some don't. Do I have that right? And and how does that transition look into the future, I think? Yeah, um, mutual funds are not going away per se. And I see, say, I see one guy just commented, I love my physical media. And, and look, there's all, even closed end funds have $500 billion and they are really bad. They're the equivalent of like a, a eight track tape, but they still hang around because there are either people who like to play the, the, the percent premium discount. I'm no, I'm not dumping on all those other kind of things. I just think predominantly going forward, ETFs will be the, the king. So, um, your point though, 401k plans are kind of like mutual funds Alamo, um, yeah. because ETFs do lose some of the superpowers. When you put them in a 401k plan, you don't need to day trade your 401k. So intraday liquidity doesn't matter. You can get the institutional share class of a mutual fund in your 401k because your whole company is rallying together as one big investor. Therefore, the cost difference isn't as great. And then the third thing is the tax efficiency goes away because your 401k is tax exempt. So it's uh, ETFs have less power there. That said, when you look at the 401k assets, there's about four, four or five trillion ish. O over half of that is in index mutual funds that cost nothing. So the ETF 
revolution, so to speak, is also sort of co-joined with the passive revolution that Vanguard started. So index mutual funds rule the 401k market. That's why ETF sort of took the index mutual fund and said, hey, let's make this trade. So overall, 401k plans, like I'm in a 401k plan and I don't use ETFs in it. And I'm happy because I have an index mutual fund right. I class fee and I'm not trading it. So I could care less. So I don't even complain there's no ETFs and I'm an ETF lover. So therefore, right. I just think 401k plans um, are going to get overrun by the passive low cost thing, even if it doesn't mean the ETF will be part of it. Is there anything stopping a 401k provider from allowing or offering ETFs? Yeah. They're tricky. Well, they're trickier because also when you buy a mutual fund, there is no bid ask spread. You just buy it yeah. at NAV. Right. With an ETF, you have to pay the spread. So it could be costly to kind of buy every week or whenever the 401k has to buy. Um, there's also some regulations about like shares and fractional shares, where as a mutual fund, you can just buy whatever you have in dollar form in that NAV. So there's a little bookkeeping accounting that just make ETFs also easier. And it's for those reasons. But for, for a small plan that can't afford the I-class, that is where ETFs make sense because those little costs get overrun by paying the A-class fee versus the I-class fee of a mutual fund. So I've, I've heard of some smaller plans outsourcing to ETF, uh, ET, all ETF 401k plans, which to me makes sense. But the bigger plans, if you can uh, afford the institutional class, that see, I, I always think ETFs, generally gave the I-class fee to everybody because mutual funds are designed as reg regressive tax systems. The less you have, the more they charge you, which sucks. So right. only the big investors get charged low fee. That's how they attract the big investors. So the right. I-class, ETFs are all I-class or cheaper. Sometimes they're cheaper than the I-class. And so that's beautiful thing, right? They basically eliminated. And so everybody pays the same fee in an ETF, but it's all institutional level fee, which is cheap. All right. Now that we ate our vegetables, we <laughs> talked about 401ks and everything. Now let's get down to the good stuff and why we're here. Going into this Bitcoin ETF thing, and I've been a huge bull, so I'm, you know, I'm not one of these like anti-Bitcoin people or anything like that. Quite the opposite. I, I guess, assumed that there would be a lot of inflow. I assumed that institutions finally, for a lot of the reasons you said, you know, the safety and the custody and all of that stuff, institutions now are coming in. Also, their mandate allows them to now do that, all of those things. I did not think it would be this much this fast. Um, and Straz was like, well, I never even thought about it. All right, cool guy. <laughs> I want to know what, what what you thought, Eric, going into this, this situation and then now looking back on it, did you underestimate it? Did you overestimate it? Were you spot on? Let me know what you thought. What do you think? Uh, yeah, so I think I uh, correctly estimated the first couple of days. Uh, it, it was a, there's fanfare. They line up, all the issuers line up friends and family. And you expect some hurrah. And there was. And then it kind of went down, right? And I thought, okay, it's going to settle into like 50 million a day. But what I did not expect was the second wind. About week four, it just started creeping back up. And then there was a day where they netted a billion. And I was like, holy shit. Um, what the hell's going on? This defies normal launch physics, even for a hyped up launch. And then they started trading like uh, 10 billion a day. I mean, iBit was in the top 10 most traded every day. Um, it's kind of gone down to about number you know, 15 the past couple of days. But that was crazy stuff. So basically, these ETFs, we're starting to pull in the kind of cash that you would expect a Vanguard fund. And not just any Vanguard fund, but their top cash getters. That was weird. And so I thought the second win was really impressive. Um, and I thought that what also impresses me and what I try to explain to people is even when Bitcoin has a, a rough couple days, uh, the ETFs tread water. Uh, maybe they'll see an outflow day here and there. Remember, they're all fighting GBTC outflows. So they have to... They're not just going from zero. They've got to overcome GBTC and then go. And they've been doing a good job of that. GBTC dumps 300 million, they'll do 310. GBTC dumps 50 million, they'll do 200 million. Sometimes GBTC dumps 300 million, they do 200 million, and it's a negative 100 million. And people are like, oh my God, they saw outflows. But the nine that aren't GBTC have done a great job of taking in money every day. One stat that's, that's also interesting is iBit and FBTC have taken in cash for 55 straight days. That's insane. 
amongst active streaks, I think the next one is like 11 days. Wow. Right? Against all-time streaks, they're already in like the top 20-ish in terms of all-time streaks ever. This is amongst 5,000 ETFs launched. And it's never, ever happened with a new fund. Usually a fund launches and it gets hot, you know, year three. Or it's a Vanguard fund that starts to get big. But it's really weird for a launch right off the bat to just start a streak and go to 55 days. I've never seen that. It's unprecedented. So I think the only thing that I worry about is that the uh, when moon crowd, which is like the complaint that the people who expect like 10% returns a day, they're they've gotten spoiled rotten with this. They're they're now ARK saw $87 million of outflows yesterday, even though the other ones made up for it. And they start crying and moaning and bitching about 80 million out. And <clears throat> ARK took in money 50 out of 55 days or something. Oh. People have to chill out a little. I would look at it this way. You have to just acknowledge that even if we stop now and went to the end of the year with no flows whatsoever, it's a smash hit, a blockbuster success for the first year. So I would look at it that way and look at anything else that happens from now as gravy. That way you, you, you've got to manage your expectations, I think. So they blew away my expectations. Now I'm already bracing for, okay, Maybe there's a couple outflow days. Maybe somebody gets spooked by the volatility. Maybe some friends and family that hooked the issuer up early. They're like, okay, you guys are fine now. I'm going to move my money out. So we could see some of that. Um, ARC, B, ARC has a, a real policy of taking profit. So if ARC B starts rising up in ARC W uh, and the weighting goes to like higher than Kathy wants it, she'll sell some. So you're going to find outflows here and there. I would just expect it. And GBTC, the good news about GBTC is I believe all of the sort of unlock legal, non-sentimental outflows are, are pretty much winding down. So I think that GBTCs should be more of a trickle. So the nine will have less of a hurdle going forward, which I think is good. But I don't see the nine being Herculean anymore. I, I, I think they'll, they'll settle into maybe, you know, net 100, 200 million a day. Um, and that's still amazing. And I think, again, I just want to sort of make sure everybody has perspective. Because if you get used to the next nine months looking at like these three, I think you'll be disappointed. I think you have to sort of really keep perspective. And you know that phrase, the path to hell is paved with high expectations. Um, I've seen it play out with these crypto people sometimes. They're like, they're miserable when they have nine days in a row that are great and the 10th day isn't. And they said they just, they, they sound like a spoiled brat, to be honest. I, I worry about them. I mean, so here I, I am. I, I I'm a 60-40 guy. I just want 8% a year compounding. Eric, I wouldn't so, worry about him. It's not your problem. Let, him, okay. let, let, let them worry about one moon. Uh, here's a question. It's all this volume, I mean, you had more volume in IBIT than you did in SPY or QQQ. I don't know how many days you would have the data, but you'd know it off the top of your head. It was a whole bunch of days, right? The volume in, in what? Say it again, IBIT? In IBIT yeah. was more than QQQ or an SPY for a few days? No, 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 there was more individual trades. Right. Got yeah. It. So, so not total dollar volume. Yes, absolutely. So, but the dollar volume, so IBIT would be trading as a group. They traded in the ballpark of like what IWM trades, which is the third most traded ETF. So as a group, oh, they were they were in the top five as a group. Okay. IBIT was seven alone, was seventh place alone. Wow. GBTC was big. Uh, at one point, I think there was five or six of them in the top 50. Even BitB showed up in like as 48th. And this That's is total dollar volume. Total dollar volume. Yeah. Wow. That's and unbelievable. What's also interesting to me is the spillover. Since they launched, MicroStrategy is trading as much as Amazon. Bitto, which we thought would be depleted because it's Bitcoin futures, it's seen a ton of volume, probably because market makers are using it to hedge and stuff. So, and also BitX, which is 2X Bitcoin futures, that started trading upwards of 500 million, a billion a day. So the whole ecosystem is just flooded with money. And it's like this gigantic, like I call it the getting is good. And so all of everybody who's been within earshot of a Bitcoin ETF has been really, they've all eaten. Even the last place one, which is Wisdom Tree, yeah. is I think closing in on a hundred million dollars. It trades about 20 million a day. If that was a regular launch, and we looked at the last 500 ETFs launched over the past 12 right. months, um, that would be a top 5% launch. The so last place one. 
Hold That's on. One more, one more ask. key point. I have one yeah. more key point here to make. All these other ETFs you're talking about, Eric, they all trade options. These don't even trade options yet. Right. This well, is without options. This is without being on major wirehouse platforms. Um, and this is with also just a, I think they have to overcome a lot of PR. I mean, uh, SBF just went to, they just find him that reminded everybody that there's crooks here. So I think they also have, they have a lot of hurdles. So for them to do all this without those other catalysts kicking in, um, I, again, I think is really impressive. It's, uh, it, I, I anticipated 10 to $15 billion in net flows in the first 12 months. They're already at 12. So they're already like almost to my upper band, uh, with nine months to spare. Now <laughs> Bitcoin could go crash and it could spook some people. I do think the holders will be stronger than people think. I don't see, you know, 50% or a hundred percent of the people leaving. But you could have 10% of the flows that came in getting spooked if there's, say, a 30% drawdown. Um, but if they can maintain this sort of like band uh, above whatever and maybe even go up, um, I would as assume my inflow expectations would be blown away. We're not going to reset them. We'll, we'll just basically give credit to the market for doing a good job. But it looks like $15 billion is going to be way underestimated. Is that where we're at? Is that total assets in all the Bitcoin ETFs? No, no, no. So. Total assets is fifty-five billion. Fifty-five billion. Yes. And so, what's the total crypto market cap, JC? Two point six. Big, well, Bitcoin specifically is one point three trillion. How big does that number get relative to Bitcoin market cap? You Great question. You, Great you question. mean like so the ETFs own four percent of all the Bitcoin? That's, is that what it is? Yeah. That's so got to go higher over time, no? But yeah, it'll get higher. Trust me, because I have seen something interesting. If the ETFC flow day in and day out, there's been a run where they have like seven days of strike, but Bitcoin will still like struggle or go down, or it'll go down worse than the, e if the ETFs do nothing, Bitcoin goes down 6%. There are definitely people selling. Um, I've heard that it's leveraged traders. I've heard that it's people who got in early who need money for stuff and are cashing out. So it does appear there is some kind of a transfer from some of the crypto world into the ETF world. And the ETF world will slowly, that 4% number should grow because of that. Yep. And so I, I think you could be at a ultimately 15, 20% here because so yeah. we're at 4% in three months. Let me just do the math. The other thing is. And then MicroStrategy zones another 1%, right? Yeah, you know, MicroStrategy is at like, yeah, 1% or 2%. But I'll give you some context here. ETFs own about 8% of all stocks. So Bitcoin's still a little less than that. Wow. ETFs own about 1% of all gold. So they're four times that already. What percent ETFs, of all stocks? I one, that. one percent. No, of all stocks. Four, eight percent. Eight, eight. And then ETFs own about 4% of all bonds. So they're right about the bond level. So they're already kind of right in with, where they are with others. So they're, I think I'll see them surpassing the stock level. There's so many players in the stock market. But it seems to me that based on what we're seeing, ETFs, no, no, not 80%, eight. Not 80%, Rachel, eight. eight. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, that, that's, that would be some article. I would get in trouble for that. 8%. Um, so, yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm actually just responding to the chat. Um, so, uh, I would see them getting to 15, 20%. And I think the, the, the 8% in the stocks, by the way, is an interesting stat because I, I also, I have to kind of remind people that ETFs are not the, the tail wagging the stock market dog. And now I find the same argument happening in crypto. People are like, are the ETFs controlling the market or are other players? ETFs are now a legitimate part of the market. What I have noticed, I heard in Asia, they have algos that are basically trading off of the ETF flow. So if the ETF flows are positive, they buy Bitcoin. So there could be amplification on the ETF flow. So even though they're only 4%, the other thing is this, there's something called float. If we talk about the float of Bitcoin, how much of that Bitcoin actually is up for grabs? So if we know 18% is people who lost their Bitcoin, that's off the table. There's probably 30% of people who are just never trade, like the Michael Saylor types. So I think half of the cryptos, the Bitcoins, probably you cannot trade it. So of the float, you could already be at 8%. Therefore, yeah. I do think the ETFs will have a, an impact on things, but I don't think they'll be everything as we've seen. And but I think as they you're get, being a little conservative on that flow, by the way. Of what flow? Of the float that you're referring to, of what's being traded and not traded in Bitcoin. I think you're being a little conservative with your estimates. I think it might even be more than that, but to your point. You, you, you yeah. mean that, okay, well, 
what percent of the all the Bitcoin out there do you think could be gotten if the if if there's like like I, I guess at some point if it goes higher that number goes up because more people are willing to sell at a higher price. But what's interesting about Bitcoin is you've got eighteen percent gone forever. So already that four percent is about six percent. Yeah. So as we get more into P and Sailor will never sell. So there's another 1%. Right. So as you add up the people and the government, the government owns a, a good chunk of it. Do so they? anyway, yeah, really? the government owns like, um, I want to say like 8%. Is that the, the U.S. government owns 8% of all the Bitcoin? All, all, no, all governments, like just governments in the world. I, I guess when they seize it, they own it. Like the way they own like cocaine of the drug bust. Got it. Something like that. But Do we that's know how why, much the U.S. owns? Um, I can get that for you. I forget. Hold on. Let me just, I can pull it up while... While you're don't on the they, phone, because I want to make sure I got this number right. <laughs> don't they seize it though, and then auction it off, like they did with the FTX assets? Don't they like? Yes, I think eventually they they do sell it. So I think maybe but, they're hodlers. <laughs> I think for some of them, let me. I'll give you the number right now. This, by the way, I got a quote that it is from Rivers. Uh, hopefully they're reputable. But this person who sends me for this uh, ETF person, I mean a Bitcoin person. So governments own. Oh, sorry, three percent. So they own three percent of the Bitcoin. Businesses own 3.6%. Individuals own 57%. Is Satoshi, the, oh, Satoshi owns 5%. And I guess they'll he'll never sell or whatever. Or she. She. So you have 5 and 17. That's 20. That's a quarter will never sell. So, so the, the float is an interesting part of the dynamic. And I think that's why you could have ETF flows that are, uh, say, a billion dollars in one day have more than a billion dollar influence in the market cap increase because the less float, the more that buy order should increase the price because there's less market. Make sense? In other words, the, the price will, should go up quicker if there's less people selling for that buyer. So float versus total Bitcoin to me is an underrated part of this story. No, agree 100%. I think the demand side of the equation is so much more important than the supply side. People keep talking about this having, you know, right? 93% of all the Bitcoin's already been mined. So half of whatever's left, is it is it going to make as much of an impact on the supply? Like, it's not bearish, I don't think. But how bullish is it? I think the demand side of the equation is definitely the story. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, look, I, I somebody just commented on Twitter that the, the F and ETF stands for fake. <laughs> Which is like, because I, I got this a lot. When the ETFs launched, people were like, it's paper. It's paper money, fake, You not your keys. And I get that. If you are the kind of person that is all about quoting how FDR confiscated the gold in the 20s, and, and you're all in and you see like a Mad Max future where everything collapses and the people with the Bitcoin rule the world and the water and all that shit, you definitely should not use the ETF. This is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> but for most normal people who can't barely remember Amazon passwords and are busy it's with shit, it's the opposite. ETF is the perfect solution. Okay. It's safe. It's convenient. It's cheap. It outsources it. It's even got the SEC stamp of approval. It's beautiful. So let's just make that clear because a regular person who they might not even, they might not even have that Mad Max vision, but they kind of are buying into the idea that a, this is an interesting risk asset, and I don't want to kick myself if it goes to a million dollars. That alone gets people in. And the second thing is I think most people understand that uh, devaluation of the dollar and inflation can actually take away from your other investments in real terms. Most people understand that, and that can be another reason to buy. But even if you understand those two things or you buy for those reasons, most of those people are not going as far as the Mad Max afterworld where you have to own it or it doesn't count, they're cool with like just getting the ETF and basically outsourcing it and they never have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about the words. I saw some guys trying to dig up a landfill in Scotland because his hard drive got thrown out like 10 years ago. So he still wants to like dig because it's like, it's like $500 million. <laughs> they got to make a documentary about the lost Bitcoiners. I want to see like four studies almost like they did the quarterback documentary on There's netflix some of them on youtube eric there's some of them on youtube you okay there are okay Hold on. this is a good question that i have for you sorry Strasser. this is important you're talking about the regular person the everyday people you know the non mad mad max and all that stuff but isn't the real story here and and I, 
maybe I'm wrong, but for me, isn't it the ability for institutions for like real commas and zeros to now step into this market for the first time ever because their mandates allow them to, because even for the comfortability of the SEC stamp of approval, but even just the mandates now allow them when they couldn't go over to the old block and chain. Now they need to, now they could do it like a, like if they're buying ARC or if they're buying XLK or whatever, isn't that the big inflow, not the mom and pop? Uh, I, I would say both. Uh, when l Let me 50, ask you this. Though, Eric? Well, you oh, hold on. Oh, do you consider a financial advisor retail or institution? Let's call them retail. Okay. Now, remember, financial advisors have $30 trillion in assets, and they are the primary users of ETFs in general. If you take all ETF assets, all $8 trillion, financial advisors are 70% of that. Wow. They love ETFs. So- advisors to me are the main market for these. So here's really? how I look at it. I would say 10 years from now, I would see the same breakdown. Advisors have 50, 70% of all Bitcoin ETF ownership. Mom and pop, regular retail, do-it-yourselfers, maybe another 15%. And then 5%, 8% would be institutions. Wow. Here's the thing about institutions though. We talk about you know pensions and endowments. They have a lot of money, but they... What what they need is liquidity. So these ETFs are just now getting liquid enough. They trade a billion a day. Like that's why I bet trading volume is a big deal, because the one thing that the best bait for institutions is volume. One because they'll use spy still over VU and IVV, which are way cheaper, just because spy is more liquid. They love liquidity right. because they can go in and out. They don't move the market. No one knows it's them. It's quick. It's convenient. They won't go into an ETF that only trades twenty million because they got to buy a hundred million dollars worth. But if something trades two, three billion a day, they're like, I can deal with this. So institutional interest should come in the coming months and years. That's why institutions are are gonna are gonna arrive, but they, they will be a, they will be a sliver, five percent, ten percent, in my opinion. The bigger money that I think is is really what's gonna happen is the advisor world. Now advisors they don't bite on day one. They do have due diligence processes. They have to talk to their clients about it. They got to do education. They've got to, is, is my platform comfortable with it? Those are the people that are interested. And to your point, they cannot self custody. So for the longest time, they had a choice of going to like Coinbase or whatever, and they're fee sensitive. They don't like the, the commissions of Coinbase aren't great. So, and they, like I said, they love ETFs, they trust ETFs. So, ET, e, having a Bitcoin ETF is like meeting them uh, on their terms. Yeah. And so the and advisor how much market. Do they have? How much of the fifty-five is financial advisors? How much of the fifty-five billion? In my opinion, it's it's a low amount right now. I'd say five billion of that. I think uh, right when, now. When will you know? Like when they do the um the yeah, so, FDV, What is it called? ADV. The thirteen Fs. Well, yeah. the financials. Oh, the fi oh, true. Because yeah. the they're, they're, they're called what they own. The the thirteen Fs are going to come in starting soon. So I looked at IBIT. IBIT already has nine owners that we know. Every owner is a mutual fund so far because they report holdings every month. That's interesting. That's another underrated buyer of these. And I saw Morgan Stanley's European Opportunities mutual fund put a clause in saying we can buy Bitcoin ETFs. Oh, yeah. And I was like, what is a European? And I, it started to dawn on me. If you're a mutual fund and you're getting your ass kicked by index funds right and left, Bitcoin can be like a PED, a performance enhancing drug. You can add a little Bitcoin ETF in there just to just to give your 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 performance a little kick in the ass, and maybe it makes you beat your European benchmark, because that's the only reason to do it. And so I also think it can help hedge from currency risk or whatever as well. You can basically like convince yourself that's why you're doing it. So I think over time the mutual funds are also an interesting market for this. So we've seen those people in IBIT. Over the next two months, we're going to see more advisors come in. Who owns IBIT? Remember, this is only the first quarter, though. Let's yeah. give this a year. Yeah. And I bet we'll, we'll see a bunch of advisors. If you are able to see 13F filings for an ETF, I would recommend going to something like IVV, which is a BlackRock ETF, or even IAU. That's their gold ETF. And look at all of the holders. You will see that it's mostly advisors in there plus a couple of institutions and all of those holders, which we'll call professionals will make up about half of the shares outstanding. The other half are too small to actually file a 13 F we'll call those retail. 
this is exactly how I see the Bitcoin ETFs playing out over time. That's fascinating. I underestimated the just the sheer amount of money coming from the financial advisors, Eric. That's fascinating, dude. Seriously. Steve, I, I feel well, like you have something it. to add. Steve, we'll dude. talk about it. We'll let Eric go and then we'll talk right. about it. I think there's also there's a there's a lot of inflows coming from people who are already involved in Bitcoin, but they just want to hold it somewhere where they're more used to. Like for me, one of the biggest things getting a big account size in crypto was Coinbase finally filing focus reports, net capital computations, customer segregation, right? And basically acting like any other Wall Street institution. If that never happened, I never would have wanted a large crypto account. Even now, knowing my money is with Coinbase, I would rather it be with BlackRock. And how many other people are thinking that way? And why wouldn't they be thinking that way? Even yeah, and the right thought to have. The other thing I noticed is Coinbase, A, the commissions are brutal if you're, if you're retail. Uh, oh. An ETF is one basis point to trade. One, not 100, not 150, not 200. And the fees are so low. The U.S. ETF market, I call the Terror Dome because it's freaking brutal. Vanguard and BlackRock aren't effing around. And the fee war played out in the few days before they launched. They're already between 20 and 30 basis points. That's that's cheaper than I thought they'd be. If you go to Canada or Europe, they're all 2%. That's why I think Grayscale underestimated the viciousness of the fee war in the U.S. I thought they thought 1.5% wouldn't be that much, you know, that would be in the ballpark. Uh, but – Tw you know, 25 basis points, 20 basis points, plus you got a brand name. Um, and in Bitwise's case, you're donating a little to crypto world or whatever. The, a lot of perks come with it. Plus you get the security of knowing that it's this high, high brand issuer. This is why the advisor world to me is the real market here because all of those people have hesitations with all those other ways. And Coinbase freezing up three times already since I've gotten into this. Since they launched, Coinbase has frozen three times. Yep. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange is not going to freeze. So that's the, this is, I thought it was a big win for TradFi personally. Coinbase is frozen, but you can still trade the ETFs. So that's there another win for, for regular people are like, yeah, that's why I use the ETFs. You don't have that bullshit. Eric is, Eric is such a TradFi bro. I love it. So that's am I. That's great. Me too. I know. I, I get. <laughs> it's funny. Have you seen that TradFi bro account? That of course. Me, yeah. Well, everything that guy says, I agree with, but I still find it funny. Of course. <laughs> I don't know why. I just like the the, the eight years in a year. You're the meme. You're the, the, 64, you're the, you're the yeah, guy but, we're making fun of. It's still funny. I don't know why. I still find it funny, but I kind of agree with what he's mocking. Like I do think sixty forty is is worthwhile. And let me ask you this, and I know because you you do stocks too, right? I mean, I see stock market TV behind you. Oh yeah, of course, stocks, so, ETFs. Of so, course. have you you've gone on? Have you gone on a hardcore crypto podcast? Um, or, or do you have talk to these people? Like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you at, if you start to in inquire a little, they're a hundred percent in Bitcoin or crypto in general. Yeah. They do not believe in stocks and bonds. Right. I was surprised at this because stocks. You know, the, the company, you, you get cash flow, like it works for your money. That's why the Credfo bro, bro guy is always talking about dividend stocks and cash flow. So I'm like, it's funny, but actually that's the truth. Like the, you, they people create value at the companies. You profit from that value created. Your money works for you. In bonds, you get a coupon. That does, it falls on deaf ears. I know, with, Eric, because the way you grew up and the way I grew up, like these kids grew up gaming you know these kids grew up in the in the meme culture it's it's night and day from the way you know traditional trad bros have grown up so for them what we do and how we look at the world is just strange it's just weird you know for them the things that you and i are kind of like chuckling at that's normal for them perfectly normal yeah i the only thing is um i just I guess like they just think inflation and devaluation wipes away anything that could be good from a 60-40. And I'm not sure if I'm there. I understand the devaluation argument. I mean, where do you, I'm just curious, where do you stand in that? Like uh, they'll, they'll say, well, if you if if you look at the real value, you you really make no money. All of that is an exercise in futility. You got to go all in on Bitcoin. Because I asked, has anybody ever 60-40 pilled a Bitcoin person? And everybody's like, it's impossible. You, all, it's a one-way street. Well, and I'm I, like, I, I'm gonna. Th I think this is for another conversation. But I think the sixty forty is stocks, commodities, not stocks and bonds. 
Yeah, in this the, in this part of the cycle, because now we're in an inflationary regime. But that's that's another conversation. That's conversation. Eric. Eric, we've we've kept you on for far too long. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric Bachunas, uh, author of this great book. You should check it out. Bogle Effect. Um, great follow on Twitter and great stuff, man. Thanks a lot for coming on. We appreciate Thank you, it. Eric. That was great. Thank you. That was fun. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Oh man, we probably could have kept talking for another hour. Yo, I mean, are you kidding me? I had so many more questions. So let's. Me too. Get... I didn't... <laughs> this is one of the best interviews we've had on this show. Uh, really, a lot of questions answered. He really is the best. Really, the authority on the, um, these new ETF launches. One thing I didn't get to ask him is: Is this now the roadmap? Like all the bullish stuff he was saying about Bitcoin, we got Ethereum spot ETFs launching soon, and then after we got Solana. So is this now the playbook, right? And we should expect the same, or is Bitcoin the special one that gets treated? That, you hear how many, that how many, is the question. You hear how many crypto phrases he dropped in there, right? Did you when see moon. that? I'm when getting, moon? I'm getting a 60, when moon. 60, 40 pilled? 60, Dude, 40 pilled? 60, 40 I mean, pilled. That's, I, I like that. That's a good what one. What does that mean, guys? What does that mean? Being that 60, is convincing a, a meme coiner to 60, that 60, 40 uh, portfolio 40. stocks and bonds actually makes some kind of sense if you talk to a meme coiner about the 60 40 portfolio they're gonna they're gonna look like you like you're an alien you know um what are we what is this like a blackout thursday we're going all black Spencer? oh we're going all black oh my fault my we're fault. going to funeral know. is this like i don't know uh, why that happened jc what do you think about what i'm saying and why why aren't you doing the same i would rather own my bitcoin in my schwab account or interactive brokers account uh, like Hands down, not even close. Before I talked to him, even more so after I talked to him, I don't know just how safe my money is at Coinbase. I know it's 10 times safer at Coinbase than anywhere else in the world of crypto. But wouldn't you, like, if you could go to BlackRock or Fidelity? You know what? I, there's, it's a time and a, there's a time and a place, Straza, for my retirement accounts and my wife and I. Yeah. If, if you're looking to put some crypto away to hodl, yeah. Right, and just have a sleeve where you're gonna be, you're gonna hold it forever. You're not gonna sell, or you're not gonna sell anytime soon. In a retirement account, you can now do that and get that, uh, to get that those those tax deferred gains, right? So it's like a unique uh, way to hodl that we yeah. didn't have before. Yeah, but you're crazy. I, 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 I almost did it. I, I almost yeah in my Roth just now. But even without that, you wouldn't rather just hold it with TradFi. No, I I, really? I like no, I like it to be I, because I I use my cryptocurrencies like as a utility. So I want to be able to press a button and transfer it to a wallet and go buy some Pepe. Like you know what I mean? I'm not. I I I, I want it to be liquid instead of having to transfer it over and go do the whole thing. If I want to get in something, I leave it. And plus, I have I have funny money that is probably never going to leave funny money. But why not just leave a liquid portion there and then everything else try to put with the tradfi institutions. I have a lot of TradFi uh, uh, exposure. Exposure. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So right. good. I think, hold on, one more point on this. All of the Bitcoin maxis, everything that they've told us now since what, the fallout of the financial crisis when this thing first started coming around in the real crazy corners of the internet, everything they continue to tell us as the bullish argument for Bitcoin is wrong. And now the latest is your Bitcoin is safer because you have some secret fucking key that you're going to lose and then lose all your Bitcoin. That is the craziest shit I ever heard. Your Bitcoin is not safer in the world of crypto. Your Bitcoin is safer in the world of traditional markets where everything has been safe forever. So if, you, if you're betting on some sort of collapse of the traditional financial system in favor of, oh, I'm going to hold my Bitcoin over here because I got a secret key. And yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather be, I'm with, I'm with Draza. I'd rather it be with BlackRock, but I don't have to make that decision because I could do both. But you think traditional markets blow up one day and collapse and don't take cryptos with it? Get the hell out of here. They're all going to be so interrelated and it's, it's yeah. going to be a total shit show. One goes, the other one's going, not going to yeah. be safe. So that's yeah. just another crazy thought. No, I think, I think listen, it's, there's not right, it's not right or wrong. It's not that the kids are wrong and the adults are right or this one's better than that one. They're just different and, and they provide different value. The HODL stuff, sure, put it with TradFi. The stuff that you're using for utilities, I, I again, I do both. I'd rather have it. I'd rather have just the ability to just press a button, you know? And people need to understand, I'm in. I love this shit. I'll buy all the craziest, you know, altcoins and shit coins. But at the end of the day, if we're talking about like a, a huge Bitcoin position, I'm going to sleep so much better at night having it with the guys that I've trusted and known and have been doing this forever. There's a time and a place. There's no right or wrong. The answer is both. All right. As it Sean, usually is Sean's around here, been, 
Sh Sean's been messaging us during the show, asking us how to uh, how we can put on an options trade through all this. And as we discussed with Eric, you, you can't, right? With these ETS, micro, but I feel like he's Jones micro, in here. You gotta go micro strategies. Is the only yeah, way to I feel like right Sean's now. Jones in for a trade. So let's bring him on right now. Honey, baby. Man, I love it. I love it when Strazzy gets fired up. I, we need more of that. Um, you think that's him? Uh, <laughs> fired up. And and I'm with Strazza, 110. percent Because I say things, Sean, and nobody listens. And I say him, I say him, I say him, I say him. And then we have an industry expert come on, and he says the same exact things, and everybody listens. I say, oh, okay. Maybe I was on to something all along. I get excited. I'm an excitable boy. I feel you, brother. Feel the answer. Good. The answer is both. The answer is both. It's not right or wrong. The answer is both. Mike, I don't worry so much about a breach as counterparty risk. They're just in this whole mess with everybody out. Like when shit hits the fan, the the number one thing that matters for these financial institutions is who owes you money. Who right. owes Coinbase money on a day to day basis? I, I don't right. know. Let's let let's move on. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Sean McLaughlin, Shawnee baby. Um, hell of a job yesterday. Hell of a job in our options execution lab. This was fantastic. We've never, you know, we talk about the trades we put on this morning. We talk about the trades we're going to put on tomorrow. But literally walking through a trade that going into the day yesterday, we didn't know what we were going to put on. It was a conversation. I essentially got exactly what I was looking for from our meeting, uh, very selfishly so. But in this particular case, um, I think personally, this is a trade that a lot of investors probably need in their portfolio. And um, got a few comments because I'm not usually one of these uh, sensationalists talking about 10x returns or 50x returns. I'm not one of those guys. I'm the exact opposite. I usually chuckle at that sort of uh, commentary. But, but yesterday we put on a trade that has the potential to at least get a 30x if we're right, if if energy does what we think it's going to do, that's 20, 30 X. And, and let's let's be clear. This is not a trade that we're either going to make 30 X or it's a failure. We True. might only make five X. Is that so bad, JC? <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> no, right. it just it has the potential, right? We're, we're looking at a, a long term chart of XLE and we put on a longer term trade. And look, XLE has tripled in the last three years off of the lows. All we're asking for is for it to double over the next three years, which on a fresh breakout, which is lo looking like it wants to do right now, is that so? Is that such a big ask? I don't think so. And if that happens, we have the potential for a 30X. I'm not going to sit here and, and expect a 30X return. It'd be wonderful if it happens. Yeah, uh, but the fact that it's even not only possible, I think probable is something that's so out of the norm for us. Um, this is, we, we never put on a trade specifically like this. We'll, we'll leave the details for members of all-star options. By the way, you can become one and watch the execution lab from yesterday and get three trades a week and all of that good stuff uh, that we put out is fantastic. Um, but I think that it speaks to, and we talked about this yesterday, the fact that we r never have put on a trade exactly like this before and the fact that the expectations can be so high, I think that speaks to how unique the opportunity is in the market itself, right? Right, and, and what I like about this trade is it really highlights, I think, some of the secret sauce about everything that we do here at All Star Charts, right? The options markets, generally speaking, if you ask anyone who knows anything about options, they will tell you that options are fairly priced, right? There's no, there's no gotchas out there. There's no hidden value. There's no secret strikes that you buy that always win. Options markets are populated by very smart people, very smart algorithms. And yes, they're all fairly priced, but options markets are fairly priced for what is the average and expected and statistically possible move? What we do at All Star Charts by blending technical analysis into, you know, being the first step into where we do trades, we are taking options bets, particularly directional options bets, 
based on what we think the market is undervaluing. And for us as options, or for me as an options trader, that gives me a unique advantage to position in directional bets that a traditional options trader might not consider. And this trade that we put out on XLE is one of those trades that it may prove that the options that we bought are so, were so, in hindsight, were so underpriced, but based on our analysis- I want my that, biggest complaint to be that we didn't buy enough. I want that to be the biggest complaint. Um, that, which that's whenever always our I'm complaint. right, that's my biggest complaint. That's right? always our complaint when we're winning, right? Like, why didn't we buy three times as much? Right. And then when, when I'm wrong, I bought too much, obviously. <laughs> um, so, Sean, on another note, um, you know, so this is a longer term trade that we put on, um, you know, that can potentially make 30x or more. And then we have a shorter term trade that could potentially pay for the costs of putting that other trade on, giving us no cash outlay which is fantastic. Can you talk about, cause you did a hell of a job of, of this yesterday. Can you talk about eating your vegetables? Like we discussed <laughs> about, you know, putting on, you know, those, those, those spreads, collecting that income when the market provides the opportunity for a high probability bet, collect that income. It pays for trades like this, doesn't it? Right. I, uh, in, in my typical portfolio mix, let's call it right. I, I as a, at right now, if I look at my portfolio, I have close to 40 positions on right now. Most of them have a directional bias. Most of them have a long directional bias. But I at all times like to have a good mix of strategies at play at all times because you never know what the market's going to do. We, we have our, our theories and our thoughts about which direction the market's going, but the market has its own sense of humor and sometimes does its own thing. So I like to have a diversity of strategies, timeframes, directions on in my portfolio. And one of the things that I love to always have on JC is I like to have uh, delta neutral premium collecting type strategies on that make money if the market just goes sideways. And after the big run we've had off of uh, the October lows, I mean, I don't know when the sideways consolidation or pullback is coming, but it's pro we're probably closer to it now than we were say two months ago. And it's good to have some some you know other type of positions on just in case we need to ride out uh, some volatility or at least some sideways action. So I like having trades on. So we did one yesterday uh, in Arc, uh, the technology ETF. Arc K. Uh, just because you know there was some nice premium there. The ETF looks like it's set up for some sideways action. We've got some pretty obvious uh, support and resistance levels that we could lean against as good risk management levels to tell us, hey, we're wrong. Let's get out. Those are the types of trades I like to put on. Love it, Sean. Hell of a job yesterday. Guys, if you missed the options execution lab, you know, we I think it's really important to go through how we decide which strike price we're going to use, which expiration we're going to use, which calls and puts, which strategy we're going to incorporate in this particular situation. We went over all of that yesterday, both a directional bet and a delta neutral bet that can pay for that directional bet if you do the math right. So um Click the link, join us. It was fantastic. You want to hit that bumper, Spencer? Hit it. Oh, wow. It's already recess. Time flies when you're having fun, right? So much fun. I got something good for you guys, too. Today was so fun. What do you got, Sean? First of all, I love the t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, right on. Old school. Um, okay. Uh, how many of you guys here on this uh, call right now uh, are have played or are interested in playing pickleball? I'm interested. I haven't played. It, it, it's the it's the new sport craze that's been sweeping America for the last four years, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I got bad news for you guys. The trend is over, and here's why. Fidel, last week there an ETF. Last week, my wife played uh -oh. and loved it. And now she's hooked and she's going to play every week. She's got this whole group in town. They play every day. She's totally in. And I'm telling you, that's the top. That's it. Wait till one tears an Achilles. They're all going to stop. Pickleball's over, folks. <laughs> you can't even get on the court down here. You, you can't. You can't play. Yeah, there's a tennis court. Club, they took down some tennis courts to put in pickleball courts. People were up, up in arms. There were protests. It was wild. Well, it's because yeah, it's, it's noisy. A, it's a, there's a tennis court about, I don't know, 200 yards out, out my window here. And every day, there, there's there's 20 people out there playing every day. Uh, okay. Uh, how about you know this? Yeah. I, I, got, I got a big job offer yesterday. Got offered a job of assistant coach. Take it. You got to take it. Team. 
Dude, I've been I've been assistant coaching my son's baseball team for four five seasons now, and it's so much fun. You have to do it. You'll love it. I don't even know where to start. Do we start with running the bases? Like I I've never I've never coached a team before, yet alone three year olds. <laughs> That's tough, exciting. Man. They can't throw or catch. Like That's this fun. is gonna be. We'll see that. You need to see, be able to throw, catch, and hit to play baseball. The they best can't part, do any of them. JC, the best part about being the assistant coach is that you don't have to come up with the lesson plan or the, the practice plan, and you already know how to play baseball. So you just follow the lead of the coach who's going to set the plan, and then you just do what you do. The coach you, is my boy down the block, and he has no idea. Like he's not. He's a he was a basketball player. He knows less about baseball. Your biggest challenge, I, I promise you, your biggest challenge will be just getting the kids to focus. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I'm going to make a prediction for the next trendy sport that replaces the pickleball craze. Uh oh. I think we're on. We're, we're on Dead the cusp. No. Par three bocce. golf? Bocce. No. A bocce renaissance here. Ooh, very soon. I like bocce yeah. ball. Do you know bocce. that we have our own private bocce court in Sonoma at the oh, uh, accelerator in May? Straza, so right. Straza, I challenge you to bocce in Sonoma. Can't wait. Right, we'll be team captains. We'll be team All right. captains. All right. Good. I love it. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Great Q is going to come in and abuse the Italian and bocce. Go Seton Hall, Big East. We, do, we, we didn't Hall even get to talk about team. Mm -hmm. Seton Hall well, has, a, has a big bocce ball team. Does who? Seton Hall. They got a bocce uh, team? No, I don't think so, but basketball tonight. Oh. All right. Fun fact, fun fact, in high school and college, my, my high school and college job was I worked at the highest volume pizzeria wing joint in Buffalo, New York. What was it called? Bocce Club Pizza. Really? Yeah. Because the pizzeria in the 1940s, started in the 1940s, and it was, it was a little pizza stand that just sold slices right next to a bocce court. And that's why it was called Bocce Club Pizza. There we go. I'm not sold on the nighttime par threes. I'm rooting for them, but uh, I don't know. I'm not quite there yet. Golf in the dark, guys. You so much your boy Lindsay. You're the one who loves your yellow balls. Yeah, but they're making it like a big like drinking nightlife thing. It, it's a sport. Let's let oh, it. Oh, it's, it's not serious. A sport. This is serious. It's a game. It's not a sport. a sport. It can be a sport for you. It is not because if you're driving a cart and drinking, it's a game. <laughs> it's not a sport. <laughs> if you walk it, like if you do Beth Page Black, not for walking. example, that's yeah. a sport. Yeah. All right. We did not get to talk about any of the stocks on my list today, but hopefully the guys will do more on Chart Request Live. That'll be at one o'clock. It's Thursday, which means Sean will do his jam session at noon right here on the channel. And uh, we're also recording a special interview today that we're going to upload it to YouTube. Not, not, it won't be uploaded today, but it'll be recorded today. Special interview. It'll be like a morning show, but like recorded and uploaded uh, um, at a later date. Oh. Very excited for that. I'm not going to say who the guest is, but you know, it's um maybe you know, the biggest like a fun guest day you, today. Such a good day. Is maybe it, the biggest guest you've ever had, and he can't it? come on in the morning, so we're oh, recording it. Easy now, easy now. Spencer. I heard a rumor. I, he, I heard a rumor up, might be Satoshi. He's up there. I don't know if he's number one though, Sean. I think right. we need to do a, a special interview series at this point. All right. I got to get back right. to work. See That's you later, it. guys. It's today nine o'clock. Ten o'clock. Go make some money. See you guys later. Smash the like. Thanks for watching. And uh, have it going. Adios. Money.